I'm reminded again of the fact that I do not deserve to even live and that he would even think about me blows my mind. I'm very grateful for his mercy. I don't know if you are, but I know that I am big time, and so I'm very thankful for that. Well, um, thank you for being here this evening. Welcome you all here, and uh, those who would watch us online. Uh, we started a series last week uh, called I Choose, and people make decisions all the time. I think some people have made some choices, and I, 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 des I decided last week that... Um, well, prior to last weekend, that I was going to preach the way I'm supposed to preach, and I'm not going to listen to anybody else telling me what I should do anymore. I'm tired of it. doesn't get me anywhere. i beating my head against the concrete for 15 years now. And so um, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do it you know, the way that 15 years ago God spoke to me and said, hey, kid, I want you to do this thing. So we're going to do this thing. And um, if it works, praise God. If it doesn't, you can come find me and... You can stone me. That's cool. Um, but uh, so I, I preached last week. Uh, uh, I started preaching a series called I Choose. And I, I know that I confronted a lot of people about a lot of things. And um, that's fine. And um, I'm just going to try to be truthful to the text. And this is what God's word says. And uh, I just know that if you lower the bar and people think they're saved, shame on me. And so if you heighten the bar... A lot of people might not, and a lot of people might run, much like the rich young ruler walked away, but that's okay. You know, we have to be okay with that. Jesus didn't go chasing after the guy when he said, I want you to, this is what I got to do get, to get saved. Do this, 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 and this, and then sell all your stuff and then go follow me. And the guy's like, I'm not going to do that. And Jesus didn't go dumb it down and go chasing after the guy and say, okay, well, you just have to do a little bit. He didn't do that. He kept his standard, right? And so... Now, Jesus is going to keep his standard. The word of God never changes. It's the same. It's never going to change. Everything else is going to fade away, but the word of God will last forever. And so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, last week was kind of like a soft intro into this week. And uh, so this week we're going to continue on in our series called I Choose. And it's not based on um, my opinion of what people should do, because it doesn't matter what my opinion is. Uh, Romans 6.16 says this, it's the, it's the basis of the whole message series. Whatever you say you, okay, now change it to what it should really say. I. Whatever I choose to obey becomes my master, right? And a lot of people feel as though these things own them and they're a little victim and oh, I have to do this and I have to run to that every single time this thing happens. But the word of God says what you choose to obey becomes your master, and so it's a voluntary slavery situation. And this is not something that you're going to hear in the biggest churches where they're, you know, making people happy, right? To say, hey, listen, God wants you to be a slave. Sign up here. It's not going to happen often. But this is what it says in the Bible. What you choose to obey becomes your master. And so um, I choose, right? We've got to make some big choices. So the big choice last week, first thing, no no surprise. I choose Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus Christ. And, the, and these choices that we make, this is the biggest one. It trickles down into our every day. Every little single thing we say, think, do, go, who we hang out with, everything revolves around that. Choose today whom you will serve. And so today I want to make a choice to choose Jesus Christ. And to choose Jesus Christ is not something to be taken lightly. There's some, there's some um, sub choices, I guess you could say, that are necessary when you say, I choose Jesus Christ, so it doesn't need to be uh, worshiping me with your lips, but your heart is far from me, okay? We want to get the heart caught up with your mouth. And so the, the heart needs to make some decisions. And so when you say, I choose Jesus Christ, that means I choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah, Acts chapter 2. Uh, may, clearly, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. So that means that 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 that. Jesus Christ and his perfect life and his single sacrifice on the cross is all that gets you into heaven, and that's it. That's Messiah, okay? Have you done that? And then to be Lord, okay? You can't have one without the other, so if he's going to be Lord, that means you do what he says. We don't need a major theology lesson on that. Jesus says, jump, what do you do? Why aren't you jumping, right? Someone should have gotten right up and jumped. That would have been the more appropriate answer. Jesus says jump, we jump. He's Lord and Messiah. 
I also choose to be a servant like Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, we have to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Although God, he emptied himself and took the humble position of a servant. And that's what we're supposed to be. So when you choose Jesus, you choose to be a servant like Jesus. And then last but not least, I choose to be hated like Jesus. I choose to be hated. You'll be hated from all because of my name. And in uh, John chapter 15, I, I think it is, he says, uh, if they hate you, it's because they first hated me. And the world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't because I called you out of it, so that's why it hates you. And so we have to be willing to be the scent of death and doom to those who are perishing in order to be the, the fragrant scent of God to those that are being saved. Okay? So that's A, B, C, and then I choose Jesus, D, new stuff. You ready? I choose Jesus means I love Jesus above all else. I love Jesus above <coughs> all else. So let's take a second and let's just pause and let's talk about love for a second. I think personally that the word love has been hijacked. I think that the word love... Um, it's just like an attack on the word love. I think it's just, uh, it's used like nothing. It's a powerful word and has powerful implications, you know. By definition, let's just, talk, let's just talk surface level for a second. Let's just talk Webster's, right? We know that that's not the end all. But let's just talk Webster's for a second. The word love in the Webster's means an intense feeling of deep affection. Is that true? Very true, right? Totally true. But we know that there's more than that, right? Because love is not just a feeling. It's a what? It's a doing, right? Right? It's both. Okay? But let's just talk surface for a second. Let's just, let's just forget what we know for a moment and just talk surface definition. An intense feeling of deep affection. Well, it's obvious that we don't have, like, feelings of deep affection for everyone, or everything, right? We don't. And so it's not, it kind of should be reserved for certain things, I would suggest to you. But yeah, we throw the word love around like it's some little cheap little $2 word, like it's nothing. Let me tell you what I mean. Like, so here's a little list, right? Um, I love God, right? That, yeah, that make, does that make sense? Yeah, I love my wife. Is that good? I love my kids, I love my brothers and I love my sisters. Well, you guys are getting quiet here. I love my mom. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> I love my dad. Awesome. I love the Gators. I love, coming at you, Mama. I love Clemson Tigers. I love my country. I love Florida. I love the wet. You shush, Jamie. I love the weather here, man. I, I, I love that I get to go to the beach. This beach is on both sides. I, I love the fact, listen, for me, I love to, to ride my motorcycle in the middle of the winter time. I love my car. I love my new shoes that I got. I love my old jeans. I love my recliner. I love lasagna. I love everything. Awesome. So we can haul out no all we want, but at the end of the day, most of us are saying things like this all the time, and we don't even think about it. We just use it all the time. Now, certainly these things are good things. All good things come from the Lord. They're to be enjoyed. But honestly, like, when I'm going down the list, when I was at I Love God, you guys could, like, feel that, right? But when I got down and I started going down the list to lasagna, you kind of can, you, you, you could feel it, right? It was like, it's, it's just a bit much to say. When you start to really think about it, it's just kind of a bit much to say, you know, I love lasagna and I love the gators. I would just say that's, that, you know, the Tampa Bay Bucks or the Patriots or whatever your choice team is, that, you know, they, they're, they're to be watched and they're to be rooted for. But loved? Has Tom Brady or Tim Tebow ever 
breathed life into your lungs? Has, do they even know who you are? Have, they, have, they, have either one of them ever gone to a, a, a bloody cross to pay for your sin that you might live forever? No, not at all. But yet somehow we all, just about all, would classify, it's, we'd say, I love Jesus and I love Tim Tebow. It just seems a little bit like a knock to the one who really deserves it when we use it so cheaply. Love has massive implications. That word is powerful. And uh, let me just tell you what I'm talking about here. You know, in, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, <coughs> verse 25, it says, Husbands, <coughs> love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay, awesome. I should do that. Verse doesn't end. He laid his life down for her. See, when you start using the word love the way God uses the word love, it has some implications, right? You can't just throw it around like, yeah, I love my new shoes. You don't do that, right? Maybe, maybe, look, Jesus Christ laid his life down for the church. And so when, when God says love your wife as, as Christ loved the church, then maybe not physically having to ever lay your life down for your wife, but certainly willing to do so if need be, right? How about your kids? How many people in here have kids? Certainly you'd lay your life down for them, right? Step in front of a bullet, jump in front of a bus, doesn't matter what the situation is, you would gladly lay down your life for that child, right? Why? Because you love that child. But would you die for your new car? Would you die for your nice house? <coughs> would you die for your career? Would you die for lasagna? Would you die for... Of course not. So stop saying, I love steak. And I love my new shoes and whatever else that we say. Now, why am I dwelling so long on this? Well, the reason I'm dwelling so long on this is that when you say you love Jesus, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you in this room, would, if asked personally, one-on-one, -on -one, you'd say, yes, I love Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> you would say you love Jesus. But saying I love Jesus has massive weight, and so you need to know what love really is. Because you can't say it lightly. You have to know what you're talking about when you say it about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you why. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and look at verse 22. And I want you all to do it. Don't just listen to me. I want, you to see, I want you to lay your eyes on the words of God. 1 Corinthians, uh, is it, no, I think it's 16.22. Or fifth, I don't know, what is it? 15.22? No, it's, it's actually supposed to be 16.22. That's incorrect on the screen. Okay? 16.22. Almost the last little blurb that Paul says in this letter. <clears throat> I don't know what Bible you have in front of you, but this one that I have in front of me says, If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Do you feel the weight on your shoulders now? Do you understand why I'm dwelling, dragging my feet here for a few minutes? If anyone, who, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Now, some of the other translations, older translations, like King James and such, they wouldn't say, it's, they wouldn't say cursed. It would say anathema. Anathema, one of the definitions of anathema is cursed. But it's also defined as banned, excommunicated. Okay, excommunicated meaning like officially excluded from the sacraments and services of the church. If you don't love the Lord, now we've got to figure out what love really means, right? Because if you don't love the Lord, you're officially out. You're booted. You're gone. You're cut off. Think deported. See you later. You're out of here. If you don't love the Lord, 
So now we got to, it's important. Don't you think it's important to figure out what love really means then? Right? Because if not, you're done. Like, I, is anyone, did I make that up? You're reading it, right? Okay. So you're anathema, right? This ain't no plate of lasagna here. This is important. So when you say I love Jesus, that has real meaning and implication that we need to understand because I don't want to be cursed, right? So what does loving Jesus actually look like biblically, not like according to the Webster's or some love romance novel, okay? So here's, here I have a couple things that I jotted down in my notes. Maybe you'll jot them down in your notes as well. Here's, 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 how, we gonna, here's how you love Jesus, okay? Um, here's the first one. You, you love the Lord with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, Okay, that's what the Bible says. Uh, J- Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of all? Love the Lord with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's Luke 10, 27. This is a holistic love, okay? This is a full body, full life love, okay? Mind, heart, soul, strength. Mind, it's where you think, right? So what is love? Something you should be thinking about him all the time. You should be thinking about who he is. You should be thinking about who you are. You should be thinking about what he did for you. You should be thinking about the love that he, the mer- your mercy, Lord. Like You should be thinking about that with all of it. Like all the time, it should be frequent all the time, over and over, constant, nonstop. The bar is high that Jesus sets, and we're trying to play limbo. It's a high bar. He says to love me with all your mind, thinking, and then your heart. Feeling, feeling, right? There's the Webster's part of it, right? A a feeling of of deep affection, right? It's your heart. You should feel the love. You should, it should be like just just bubbling up inside of you all the time. And as you spend time with your loved one, right, you fall in love more. So you should love him with your, you should be thinking and feeling and then with your soul, right? This is the immaterial part of you that's going to last forever, long beyond your years here on earth, right? So what does this mean? That your love is enduring. It's persevering. It's all the time. Make a decision and stick with it, right? It's not a, I love you today. Uh, He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me. No, no, all the time. I make a decision today. I love Jesus Christ. It's a, that's the soul. That's everything, all the time, forever unchanging. That's what he commands of us. And then strength, mind, mind, thinking, heart, feeling, soul, lasting, strength, showing, right? Does it show? How do, you, how do you show your, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parents, your kids? You don't just have it in here. You let them know about it, right? You don't just have that love. You tell them, I love you. You show them. You love them. When they're getting married, you cry. When they're in trouble, you, you, you get angry, right? But that's a passion, and you show it, right? You do something. So I don't know. How are you going to love the Lord? Maybe you'll cry. Maybe when the songs play, you cry. Maybe when the songs play, you yell, Amen. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe you reach up and hug him. I don't know what it's going to show. Maybe you serve him with all of your heart. But strength, God's given you a body. He said, give your bodies as a living sacrifice. So you should use your strength, use your body physically to show the love that you have for God. Thinking mind, feeling heart, lasting soul, showing strength. Now, not all, he says, I want to clarify Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Not all as in exclusively. Don't love anything else because we know in the word of God it says what? Love your wife, love your neighbor, love other Christians. So clearly it doesn't mean just God, nobody else. That's not the way it works, right? But I would just say it's not all as in exclusive, but all as in, pause, trying to figure out how to tell you this. The best thing I could come up with was like crazy, you get it? Like crazy. Like, like crazy. Everything that you are, like getting after it all the time. Okay? That's the best thing I could come up with. That's the best your preacher has. Love him like crazy. And all this, listen, it's a command. It's a command. That means it's a will thing that feeds off of time spent with. But you make a decision that you're going to do this Jesus, what's the greatest command, he said? Not a suggestion, not a maybe, not grow into this thing. It's a command. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's a matter of will, and it feeds off of time spent with 
the object of such affection. And so we're making choices, right? So I choose to spend time with Jesus Christ, and I choose to respond with love for Jesus Christ. That's your choice. And he wants you to make it. Choose today whom you will serve. This is not a tomorrow thing, okay? So when we want to say, I, I love the Lord, I love Jesus, it must be that I love him with my whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. And there's no exception. When you, let me ask you guys a question. When you break a command of God, what is that called? Sin. So remember I said that our church is going to set a high bar now because I believe it's in the Word of God. It's a command. So if you, do, if you lax in any of those areas, what is that called? Just right. It's hard to say it, right? Because it's like, man, where's the grace? I get it. It's a command of God. And if we don't do it, it's sin. And I just don't know if you can sin your way into heaven. I'm just saying. Okay? And so I just want to throw that out there. So that's the first thing. Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Here's the second thing. It's going to sting. Love the Lord more than your blood family. Love the Lord more than your blood family. No, oh, the pastor's going off the rails. He's trying to get us all in here. Working 24-7. No. Look in your Bibles at Luke 14. I'm not going to ever say anything if I can't get it out of the Bible and show it to you. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> Luke 14, look at verse 25, 26, and 27. So, listen, um, how many people would like to see their church grow? Right? Does Jesus want his church to grow? He died for it, right? Working on it right now. And, and so here we have in this story right here, look at this. How does it start out? A large crowd. A he's got the crowd now, right? I got the audience. Things are working. The mailers hit the, the post office. People are showing up, man. It's going to be awesome. Here's all the people. So now I got all the people. So what are you going to say to these people? They're all here. And you want it to be part of your church, right? Watch what Jesus does. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turns around and he says to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, and children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. That feels weird, doesn't it? I mean, it's beyond, I mean, we can sit here and say we're all high and holy people, right? But it doesn't matter who you are. Um, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like it. I, I mean, I just think about that. Like, I love my wife. I love Jameson. Jack, I love all these guys, right? And he's saying, like, I have to love him who I can't see, who I can't, like, talk to him like I am with Danny. Like, I can talk. You know what I'm saying, right? And I have to, the command to be his disciple, and you know you can't go to heaven and be in the family unless you're a disciple. You can't be a disciple unless you, like compared to the love you have for him, that you like literally hate everybody else. Now, that doesn't mean you're supposed to hate them, right? Because we just said, the Bible also says love your wife, love Christians, you know. Love your neighbor. But compared to him. And this kind of feels weird. That's the high bar. That's the high bar. That's the super high bar. But I think Jesus knows that. Because look what he says. <clears throat> I, think he under, I think he understands that they're going to feel really like, whoa, bro. Like, I was into following you. And, but now you're telling me i got to hate my family compared to you. We just met, man. Verse 27. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. So just a simple way of picking up your cross, it's just him saying, you better die to yourself. If you want to be my disciple, you know that funky feeling you have right now that you kind of want to put your family before me? That better die. You better kill that thing because if you don't, it's going to get in the way and you can't be my disciple. Unless we get this thing straight, we can't go any further. Because if you're not all in, I don't have you. And that's what he's saying to you here right now tonight, just the same. And you need to make some choices. Truly loving Jesus has 
massive implications. And I'm not here to scare you off and say, oh, I don't want to get saved then. But I do want you, if you choose him, to really choose him. You know what I mean? So under the care that God has given to me, you know, for you guys, I at least want you to know what Jesus says to be a disciple and what it means to really follow him. I don't want any false converts that I have to answer to when I go stare into Jesus' eyes and said, why did you lower my bar? I'm not going to have that. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Okay? So <clears throat> I just want to give you some examples in the Bible, and it's not just one here in Luke 14. I just, it's all throughout the scriptures. Um, Luke chapter 9 <clears throat> verses 59 through 62. I've read it enough to kind of be able to paraphrase it for you already. <clears throat> Jesus, this guy says, hey, I want to follow you, right? That's awesome. I want to be your disciple. I want to, I want to say yes to you. And, um, but let me, let me first go back and bury my father. And Jesus is like, no. Your duty is to go preach the kingdom. Whoa. Really? I, I mean, we talked about this last week. How many people would... You know, I'm supposed to teach children's church this week, preach the kingdom, and my dad just died. And, and you call the pastor and you say, Moses, I, I can't make it to teach the kids. And I, and I say, sorry, but your duty, your duty is to preach the kingdom. How many, would you be, how many would be back here? No one. But I just quoted Jesus. And that's one of the problems with the church. You can't talk about this because you're going to offend people. And so he says, no, your do, you can read it. Read your duty is to preach the kingdom. Don't worry about your dad. He's already dead. He can't get saved now. Hopefully he is. Maybe he is. Probably not because he said, let the dead bury the dead. <clears throat> but he's, you can't help him anymore. Your priority is the people that are alive and preaching my kingdom so that when they get like your dad, they're going to heaven, not to hell. So priority says, no. <clears throat> preach the, your duty. Nobody wants to hear that. They want to hear me come up with some brilliant motivational beauty that will make you want to go serve Jesus when he says, no, it's your duty. You don't hear that in church. <clears throat> but that's what Jesus says in red. It's your duty to preach the kingdom. The next guy comes along and says, hey, I want to follow you too. But can I first just go by and can I go back home and just say goodbye to my family? And he's like, no. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and gets, work, gets, to, gets started working for me, like he says they're all in and gets going, if you turn back, you're not fit to be my disciple. You're not, he says you're not fit to, for the kingdom of God. I mean, this is, these are high bar, this is a high bar, right? But I'm not making it up. This is what's in Scripture, you know? And so you need to know, like, he, he says, listen, you've got to make some decisions. What's the most important thing to you? And I, I don't know if that's going to fill a church up but I just want you to know the truth of what God's word says so that you can make a quality choice because I'd rather have you in heaven than in my church. <clears throat> now this is a big sacrifice to be able to say no to your blood, to say yes to Jesus. And if you go to Matthew chapter 19, I would love if you'd go there just because, I, again, I just want you guys, this is heavy stuff, I want you to see it with your own eyes. Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 29. It's almost like Jesus understands that this is going to be really difficult for you to accept. Okay? And so in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, he says, everyone, who? Who? Everyone, right? Everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. I mean, if, if nothing else, Jesus is acknowledging the massive sacrifice that it would be to choose him over family by ensuring that the loss pales in comparison to the gain. And so we want you to understand, like, when you make the decision for me, not only is it a command and you better, but I want you to know I'm going to bless your socks off 
if you do it. He get, now, now, this story in Luke chapter 9 about these people that say they followed him, it's, the, it's not a Jesus taught thing. It's a one day this person came and said. Like, it really happened. Jesus said these things to people. <coughs> but he also has some parables that he teaches us with to get this point across even more. So if you go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, tell this story. Before I say it, what it says, know that when Jesus starts his ministry, he's like, tell the people to repent because the kingdom of God is near, right? What's the kingdom of God? Who, what's he referring to there? Himself. Himself, right? So these parables, Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of God, Jesus, is like this. Guy goes out in the field, finds a treasure. Woo, I can't believe I found it. And he goes back home and he sells, he gets rid of everything else he has. Everything. It's, and when he says everything, what's he mean? Everything, everything right? Je Jesus is not a loss of words. So he says yeah, he sold everything so he could have the money just to buy that field. That's the importance of the kingdom of God, which is who? Jesus, right? Having Jesus, I'll forego everything else. And then he goes on to say, and it's also like this merchant who finds this awesome pearl, right? Same thing. Get rid of everything just to have this pearl of great value. Now, he's not talking about selling off people. He's talking about selling off stuff, but the point is still clear, right? When, when you, you have to be willing to forego all other things, to say yes to Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us with words to understand truth, but it also teaches us with examples, right? So when you see Jesus start his ministry, he starts out by walking down the beach, and he sees Andrew, and he sees Peter, and, and, and what happens when he sees them? He says, hey, come follow me. Be my disciple. So what do they do? Well, I got to go back and say goodbye to my family. Well, I got my dad just died. Well, I got to no. It says they left immediately and followed him. Immediately, right? They were in. Listen, if you read the the story in the Bible, they were literally in their boats fishing. They were literally at work, working, on, like fishing right then and there. And he went up to them and said, I know you're fishing, I know you're at work, I know that you're professional, that's what provides for you. I want you to leave that right now and come follow me. They didn't even know who he is. Okay. And they did. So they start following him, right? So they see, you read it, read, read it, read it on your own, right? The same day, he's got those two guys that said yes, don't know why, must be something going on here, right? And they say yes. He walks down the same beach. He's still walking. He runs into John and James, the sons of Zebedee. And they're actually in their boats repairing nets with their dad and with the other employees. I mean, it says it right there. And Jesus walks up to them also and says, come follow me. Be my disciple. Who, who is this guy? And, and they did. And it said they actually, it says they immediately got up and left and left their father and the employees in the boat. They left their job, they left their home, they left their families instantly done. I'm going to follow Jesus. Right? And it's in here as an example for us. Matthew, same thing. Matthew's at work as a tax collector. It says that when Jesus came to him, he was literally in his booth working. And Jesus said, hey, come be my disciple. Closed. And he goes. Immediately, just like that. Why are they like that? They're examples for us. My sheep hear my voice and procrastinate. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. That's what they do. That's what a real disciple of Jesus Christ does. So one, we have to love the Lord with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. Two, we have to love the Lord more than even your blood family. And here's the third thing, choosing Jesus 
saying I love Jesus means obedience to Jesus. How about this one? 1 John 5, 3. Loving God means keeping his commandments. Drop the mic. How many people need a theology lesson on that one, right? We don't. What, what, what does it mean? It means we keep his commandments. It's loving, like just, you can, I should have had it up on the screen. Loving, loving God means keeping his commandments. So you could what? You could flip that then, right? Keeping his commandments equals loving God. Loving God equals keeping his commandments, right? Pretty simple, to the point. Nobody, does anyone misunderstand what that says? Right? We don't need any help with that. Loving God means keeping his commandments. It's the action. Look, the keeping of the commandments is the love for God. Do you understand? That doesn't really jive well with most of our thinking about love and all that. Because he's the only one that you have to do this with. But loving him means keeping his commandments. So the actual obedience to his word is the love for him. Now, this same author who wrote that, the Apostle John, in, he, that was in 1 John, but he wrote a gospel too, the gospel of John. And in John 14, verse 15, he says what Jesus said about this. And Jesus said this, but by the same pen, this John guy. First, he says, loving God means keeping his commandments. <clears throat> and in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, obey my commandments. See, the, the first one is like, keeping, my command, keeping the commandments is love. But this one says, like, if you love, that's first, right? If you love me, then you will. So it's, first is obedience is love. I love this. John takes both approaches. He covers all the bases, right? Obedience is love. And at the same time, love results in and inspires us to obedience. It's both ways. So to me, it just seemed like they were one and the same. They were inseparable. But either way you view it, obedience is required for true love for Jesus to exist. You must obey his commandments to say that you love him. Because if you say that you love him, but you won't obey him, you do not love him. It says it. Loving God means keeping his commandments. Okay? So how many things does Jesus command? Well, I did some research this week. Like, I took time, and I really figured out how many, and I came up with this. It's lots. Lots. Okay? I can't give you an exhausted list, because we'd be here for a month, of all the things that he would command. <coughs> so I want to choose one. One commandment. And we're going to spend the rest of the evening talking about it. <coughs> because it's that important. And from where I stand, it's that neglected. <clears throat> Worldwide. If choosing Jesus Christ means loving Jesus Christ, then choosing Jesus Christ means obeying Jesus Christ. And if choosing to obey Jesus Christ means loving him, then we must choose to be addicted to his mission to build his kingdom. And there's no way around that. Loving is obeying. He did this thing called the Great Commission one time. I, you might not have heard of it. He said, go preach to the nations. Go tell everyone about me. I want you to convert. I want you to get people converted, man. I want you to get them baptized. I want, you know, I want them to say yes, dunk them in the water, and then I want you to teach them everything I ever taught you. I want you to make disciples. Go build my kingdom. That's what he told us, right? And he said what? Loving God means keeping my commandments. And he told us to do something. And so we must choose to be addicted to his mission to build his kingdom. 1 <clears throat> Corinthians 15, 16 tells us the story of this guy, Stephanus, and his family who got saved. 
And it says in that verse that I just referenced that Stephanus and his family, your Bibles, if unless you're reading King James, they'll say they devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They devoted themselves. The King James Version would say that Stephanus and his family addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, right? It's only, listen, we throw addiction around like it's like all the time, right? But the Bible says something different about it, right? I think we use it more, I think we put more value and weight on addiction than God does. God uses it one time in the entire Bible. And it's your choice. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. Cigarettes don't own you. Drinking doesn't own you. The mall doesn't own you. Your cars, your credit card, women, men, whatever, drugs, nothing owns you unless you choose it. Now, you can, you can argue with me till you're blue in the face, but at some point, every Christian must take their opinion and put it in the back seat and let the word of God be true. That's it. And he said what you choose to obey becomes your master. And Stephanus and his family chose to be addicted to the ministry of the saints. You see the power of choice is right there on display, right here in God's word. He's like, I am devoting myself. I am addicting myself. I am choosing to be addicted. Like, I have to do this. I'm, 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 I'm addicting myself in joining Jesus in building <clears throat> his church. So I'm on his mission with him. Well, what's Jesus doing? What's, what's his mission? What's he doing right now? that I should be addicted to. I just let that word sink in for a second. Addicted. When you're addicted to something. It's like all-consuming, isn't it? I can't stop. Let's just, let's just call it what it is. I can't stop. I want to. I can't. I, I, I don't know what to do. I try this. I try that. I cannot stop. And the Bible says that they chose that life. And what's Jesus doing? What's his mission? Well, Matthew 16, 18, I'm, I'm building my church. That's what I'm doing. Uh, Luke 19, 10, I came to seek and save that which is lost. That's what he's doing. I want all to come to, to, to be saved and, and to understand the truth. Jesus came to this earth preaching of a kingdom that he reigns over. The king of a people known as his church, his body, his bride. That's his kingdom. He, he loves his church. He laid down his life on a, on a nasty old cross for his church. Jesus came on a mission to build his church, his kingdom. And to choose him means that you choose to be addicted to his mission as well. There is no, there, there's no backing down from that. Like, that's the way it is. Christ followers follow Christ. They hear my voice and they follow me. And we make a choice to be addicted to his mission. And his mission was to come from heaven to this earth to establish a kingdom here where people would worship him. That's what he wants. That's what he went to the cross for. And so if you're one of his, that is now your mission. Okay? And you're to be addicted to it. That means what? Say it. I can't stop. I can't stop. No matter what, I can't stop. That's what drives me to this pulpit every single week. I can't stop. I can't stop. <clears throat> um, how long ago were we up in Washington, D.C.? Six, eight months ago? And I don't know how long it was, but we went up there, and um, one of the places we went to was the National Archives up in Washington, D.C. Anyone ever been there? Anyone ever been up to the archives? Nobody? One person? Yeah, a long time ago. I think we should have a picture of that in there, don't we? Do we have a picture in there? There it is. Like, that's one special room in the National Archives. That room, in that room, is the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights in one room. That's an important room, right? <laughs> that's an important... When there's no one there, that's the most important room in the world. Right? Like, that's crazy. So how many people just, that you know just hate their job? Like you, you know people that just hate their job, right? All the time they go to work, they just hate it, right? So I'm, I'm up there in that room one day, and I went through the line, and I mean, it's important, but it's just a piece of paper, right, to me. I don't really care. And so I, I went through the line. I looked at it. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know. And then I, I came over, um, not that it really matters, but I came over to 
oh, right around here. And there was this dude that was just jacked, like Arnold Schwarzenegger jacked, right? And he's, 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 a, he's, he's, he's a guard, right? And, and I walk up to him, and I said, hey, man, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said, you know, I know most people just, like, probably hate their job, and I don't know how you feel about yours, but, man, you're guarding the most important room on the planet. <laughs> like, like, so I don't know if you, like, go home and think, man, my job sucks, but just know I really appreciate you. Like, that's super important. And he goes, yeah, man, I know, and that's why I'm always on point. And he just looked at me like, you know, like maybe he's thinking like I'm about to pull something off here, Nicolas Cage or something. Maybe I'm the distraction. But he's like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm always on point. Guy was like this too, right? And I'm like, I'm just telling you, man. That's a, you know. But like that guy understood. He knew why he was there. And he knew his job. And that should be us. On point. On purpose. Every moment. That guy, there's not a second that his eyes are not going like this. He knows exactly why he's in that room, to guard those pieces of paper with his life, right? That's why I got hired. That's why I'm there. And not a minute goes by that he's lax. Because when something happens, when he's lax, that's when it happens, right? I'm on point all the time, he said. And believe me, he's like, that's like, like, like uh, the, 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 the president's guys. What are they? The Secret Service, right? You ever watch them? They're never just over there whistling Dixie, you know, eating... G- Bonbons and stuff. They're, they're watching, like, and they're, they're like this. Right? Every second, right? They're on point every second. Not a second goes by that they're not focused on their job. And that should be us. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, right? On point. All the time. All the time on point. All the time on purpose. Get on point and stay on point all the time. That's what he wants. And so here, what that, what that, what's that do? It brings us right back to the question that Pastor Jay asked two weeks ago. What's the most important thing in your life? That's it. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, it's clear that Jesus says that the kingdom of God is first priority for the Christian, with no exceptions. That's the bar. First priority. Who I am and what I have, first and foremost, flowing towards this single thing, Building Christ's church. That's the most important thing in your life. And what was supposed to be the biggest, most important thing in your, in the, in the, the most important facet of the, of the Christ follower's life has been reduced down. And we've let it happen, and you've let it happen in your own lives. No one can do it for you. You've let it happen. We've let it happen. It's been reduced down to a once in a while when it's convenient, when I'm feeling up to it, when I'm not tired, if I don't already have tickets to or if my family's not visiting from, consumer-driven participation in some weekly event. It's what it is, man. It's what it is. And that's not the church of Jesus Christ at all. You want to know what the church of Jesus Christ looks like? Don't look in this room. Look in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. All the believers were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Hold up what that is. Right here, right? They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking meals and devoted to, to prayer. And they met daily in the temple and in homes breaking bread, enjoying the goodwill of all the people, all the believers, all in every day. That's what the church is. And what happened when they did that? Thousands of people got saved. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be. Now compare that to what you see in churches now. And you wonder why they're empty. You wonder why the moral fabric of a nation that was once beautiful is being shredded and it gets darker and darker and darker almost 
Instead of people getting saved every day, it gets darker every day because the institution that God established to push back darkness is pathetic and weak. And staying home instead of coming to gather their encouragement, gather their resources to push back darkness. And we just look for excuses not to participate instead of looking for reasons to do so. And that's the reason why our, our world is the way it is. You can come up with your own reason, but I'd argue with you. <clears throat> and why, listen, why did these people do this? Was it because, you know, people, have, I've heard them say this, that, well, because Jesus had done this and Jesus had done that right before their very eyes. Why were they choosing this lifestyle of all the believers, all in, all days? Why were they doing that? Were they devoted and addicted and committed to this daily, all-consuming life because God was on the move and they couldn't deny it? Or was God moving and building because the people were devoted? Look at the text, and your answer's right there. All the people did this and this and this and this, and God added to the fellowship daily those being saved. It wasn't that he was doing something awesome and they're like, I got to do this. No, they committed themselves to it and God honored it. Just look at the text. I'm not making it up. Look at it yourself. There's an order to it. It's not to be ignored or brushed under the rug. They devoted themselves to it and God responded to it. <clears throat> He's looking for people like that. These people lived on purpose. This is how we choose to live. This is what my life is all about. When Jesus Christ gave the great commission to go preach the good news to all the people and to spread his kingdom and make converts and baptize them and teach them, he wasn't playing. He wasn't playing around, right? The way that Jesus has established and ordained for his church to grow and build is through you and I. All of us, all in, all the time. That's how it gets done. And for us to think it's going to get done some other way is foolishness and folly. That's what God has said. If you read Romans eleven fourteen, 14, I know it well enough to give you this summary. How can people know, how can they believe, and how can they be saved if my people won't go and tell? How is it going to happen? How is it going to happen we spend 90% of our life building our own little life and our own little comfort instead of building his kingdom? How will they know unless they are told? And so if you and I have recognized our own fallen nature and a need for a Savior, and we've embraced Jesus Christ as our Lord and Messiah, then we have reason to, for celebration and for joy. But oh, how quickly that should shift to, to getting to work so that other people, as many as possible, can experience the celebration and joy that you have. And we can't neglect that. You've not been saved simply to enjoy being called his. You've been saved to a mission of purpose. <clears throat> so what's, what's in my gas tank to, <laughs> to make me keep going? What's in my gas tank to make any of us make this kind of commitment what keeps me going on mission to build Christ's church you might be thinking that right now like man he's he's up there and, and it seems to make sense what he's saying and but like I'm thinking about my life right now I'm thinking about my schedule my work my family my 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 finances my my psyche my brain like my health I don't know and, 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 I, and Jesus is saying, i got to just add this in too? How do, I, how do I keep going? How do I do this? What fuels my fire to make me do this? What could possibly make me abandon all else to make building his church paramount? Well, there's lots of things. Here's two. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Paul said, it's Christ's love that compels me. It's Christ's love that compels me. I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting there Listening to this song, Your Mercy, that's why. First time I heard that song was weird. I heard the original singer, your, your cousin there, sing. I didn't even like it. But then I, I started listening to it a couple times. About the third time, I couldn't stop crying listening to that song. <clears throat> it's, it's like, 
I don't know about you guys, but I, my, my, my sin is, is, I am definitely the worst sinner. I don't care what you say. I am the worst. And the fact that his mercy is there, that he allows me to even breathe, forget that I get to do this, but that I could even live blows my mind. And so this love that he has for me, it compels me. Why, why, what kept Paul going to plant churches and preach the word and get whipped and do it again and get beaten and do it again and get in prison and do it again and then get the, the prison guards saved, right? What made him keep doing this? He said, Christ's love for me compelled me. <clears throat> so his love for you can, 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 can be gas in your tank. And that's good. But the second one's not as, it's not as pretty, it's not as glamorous, but it's equally true. Luke 17, 10, Jesus says this. You can write down the reference. I just want to read it to you. We're just about done. He says, when you obey me, you should simply say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. Jesus said, I'm to be the most important in your life. And my mission is the most important thing in your life. And my command to go build my church is your job. It's your job. It's your duty. I could come up with, you know, and I'm not good enough to be able to, I'm not a creative enough guy to come up with some beautiful invita verbal invitation to you to make you want to come serve coffee in the coffee house. I, I, the, the best invite is, is what Karen gives you. Would you please do it? Like that's the best one we got. I, I could try to come up with something more beautiful that would inspire you to say, hey, Meredith, I'll teach the kids once a month. I could come up with some creative marketing trifold of all of our pretty ministries, and you should come on Wednesday night and put pictures of people that we don't know enjoying a potluck dinner because they have prettier smiles than us, and I'm missing a tooth, so I don't want to put me on there. I could do that to make you want to come on Wednesday night to, to share food with your brothers and sisters in Christ, or I could just refer to you back to Acts chapter 2 where it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to prayer. So, like, why don't, we don't have to try to come up with some pretty graphic to make you want to come on Monday night and pray. No, it's your duty. It's your duty to forsake things for him. It's your duty. It's your job. So just plain and simple, do your job. Do your job. And I know people don't really want to hear that. But listen, <clears throat> if all authority in heaven and on earth are Jesus Christ's, do you understand that? If all authority, if he is the ultimate supervisor, <clears throat> and you don't have to answer to anything else, he is your boss. He decides who's hired. He decides who's fired. He decides when you get paid and how much. All authority is his. And he told you to make building his kingdom, that him and his mission is your priority now, then what's the holdup? What's the holdup? What adjustments are you starting to make right here, right now in this room as you sit here and look at me, other than you want to kill me? What adjustments are you making in your life right now? What adjustments, what's, what's today's sacrifice look like for you to start building his church? Something different than what you've been doing. What's it look like? What's your choice to be addicted to ministry look like? But this, because this is not a, this is not an optional thing for the believer, right? Saying I love Jesus includes this. And and if if you don't love Jesus, 
anathema, cast out, excommunicated, gone, see ya, think deported, gone, okay? It's serious. I would just say to, I don't know what your choice is right now. I'm hoping you're making a choice right now. We're going to take a moment. We're going to take some, more than a moment. I want you to pray. I want you to be thinking about this because it's super important. But I want you to think of it this way. Stop coming to the restaurant to eat and strap on an apron so that other people can come in greater numbers so they can taste and see that the Lord is good. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. You already know, right? You do. So now it's your job. It's your duty, loved ones. It's your duty to ensure that as many as possible before you take your last breath can say, when their preacher says, <clears throat> who's tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that they can raise their hand and say yes. That's your duty. It's not a suggestion. It's not a request. It's your job. And pastors, including me, have beat around the bush on this one for a long time. But I'm just here to tell you with clarity, I hope, That to choose Jesus means you choose his, to love him above all things. And that means you choose to love him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. You choose to love him even above your own blood relatives. And you choose to be on mission with him. To seek and save that which is lost. And that becomes the priority of your life. Because if not, anathema. Choose today whom you'll serve. Father, would you just give us a, a moment of clarity to sort through everything that was just said? Sort through our feelings, sort through our thoughts. To hear your voice, not the voice of the preacher. We read your word, we see what it says, but even those of us that say yes to it all fall far from your standard. And we want to do better, but we cannot do it on our own. We need your help. And as we learned a couple weeks ago, Lord, as you taught us that when we pray for things that please you, we know that you hear us and, that you, and we know that you will give us what we ask. And it pleases you, Lord, to love you with our whole mind, heart, soul, and strength, to put you above all things and your mission to seek and save the lost as the priority of our life. That is the priority of your life here. And it is the, should be the priority of ours. And we have so many things that war against that and they're going through our mind right now, God. And there are things that are coming into opposition to you, Jesus, right now. And we're asking you to bulldoze those walls so that we could live in freedom as your servants. Loved ones, I just want you to take those things that are standing up against your all-in and lay them on the altar now. Lay them on the right there in your seat. You don't have to come to the stage. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to fill anything out. Just lay those things down and, and share with the Lord right now the, the struggle that you're having right now with being obedient to this clear word.
because he says, if I don't have you completely, we can't go anywhere. So lay him, just lay him out there for him and ask him to help you with this struggle right now. And just remember, loved ones, while you're working with the Lord on this, <clears throat> he knows your sacrifice. He knows that this is hard. And he has promised you great reward, a far greater reward than the loss that you might experience. Just know that. So just take a few moments and talk with him.